I get one of the monitors as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, we have no apologies that have been received today. Uh, so today the Committee will be meeting with Pascal Dunner, the Minister for Finance and Public Expenditure Reform, on his officials in advance of Budget 2019. Before this, we will go into private session for a short period to deal with the Committee housekeeping. So we are now in public session. Uh, before we begin, I, as always, can I just give the usual reminder to members and witnesses to turn off mobile phones. Um, so firstly, I would like to welcome Minister Pascal Donoghue and all the officials to the committee uh, meeting. Thank you for making yourselves available uh, to us to give us this, our pre-budget briefing. Uh, the Minister is accompanied today by the following officials from the Department of Finance. We have John McCarthy, Joe Cullen, Jerry Kenny, Pat Leahy and Ruth Sutton. And from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, we have John Canan, and I believe we're also joined by uh, Ronnie Downs, who's the new Assistant Secretary, so just to welcome you in that capacity to uh, our, our meeting here today. Uh, I know obviously it's a particularly busy time for the Minister and for you, his, the, the officials. Uh, the Committee values the opportunity to engage with you. Um, um, and we engage with the Minister on the Budget. The purpose of the meeting today is to enhance the level of engagement scrutiny on the budget process by the Oireachtas. Uh, we have produced a number of pre-budget scrutiny reports to date, as you will be aware of, and in doing so, our aim, obviously, is to offer further constructive feedback to you as Minister. Um, so I would also uh, just like to acknowledge, by the way, the assistance of the departments with us in this process to date. Um, now, before I call on the Minister, we have a little bit of housekeeping as always to do, so if you bear with me while I read out the statement on privilege. I wish to advise you that by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to the Committee. However, if you are directed by the Committee to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise and make charges against any person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or by any official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. And now, with that bit of housekeeping over, could I ask uh, Minister uh, Donahue if you are ready to make your opening statement? Thank, thank you. you and I want to uh, thank you for the invitation to be here this afternoon to discuss the forthcoming budget and to welcome the contributions that you will have to make in this regard and also for your recent report that I had an opportunity to read over the last number of days. As you know, the budget will be presented to the Houses of the Oireachtas on Tuesday, the 9th of October. Over recent months, many elements of our reformed budgetary process have taken place. In June, we saw the Summer Economic Statement, followed by the National Economic Dialogue. In July, the Government and my departments published the Mid-Year Expenditure Report and the Tax Strategy Group Papers in respect of Budget 2019. These are all new features of our budgetary process that I hope make options clearer. Earlier this month, my department published its second annual debt report and an analysis of demographic trends and their input on sustainability of the public finances. As I set out in the publication of the Summer Economic Statement, I am committed to not adopting a budgetary policy that would further increase the deficit and result in additional borrowing. The focus of Budget 2019 will be to sustain our recent progress and to maintain our careful management of the public finances. The Summer Economic Statement laid out what we believe is the appropriate policy on the basis of what is right for the economy. From a budgetary perspective, this facilitates the building up of fiscal capacity to help deal with future risks and potential shocks. In terms of where we stand now, we are in good shape. With gross domestic product up 2.5% in the second quarter of the year, quarter on quarter, and 9% up year on year, 
It is encouraging that robust growth is being recorded across all sectors of the economy, both domestically and our international traded sector. There was an annual increase in employment of 74,000 jobs in the year to the second quarter of 2018, bringing total employment to over 2.5 million euro, 2.25 million, excuse me. We are close to approaching what could be termed full employment. The net set of official macroeconomic forecasts will be produced as part of Budget 19 following the IFAC endorsement process, which is currently underway. We must, however, be mindful of new challenges in the wake of the growth we are now experiencing in our economy. Internationally, some of the other risks have been widely recognised that include a general rise in protectionist policies and the unpredictability of the international tax environment. Ireland, as a small, open economy, is particularly exposed to these risks, and we just need to be careful in relation to our budgetary policies and try to continue to look after our public finances, while, of course, meeting the needs of our society. In 140, 184 days, our most important trading partner will formally leave the European Union. Whilst the transition period remains our baseline assumption, there will still be a major structural change in our economic relationship with the United Kingdom. It's important to be clear that the actual agreement on a future relationship can only be finalised and concluded once the EU has become a third country, that is, after it leaves the EU on the 29th of March of next year. This is why agreement of a status quo transitional arrangement is so important. Of course, it is in the interests of everyone that a future relationship agreement is concluded as quickly as possible after the UK leaves the European Union to provide certainty sooner rather than later. I note that your pre-budget discussion document points to the possibility of a no-deal Brexit outcome as a potential budgetary risk. With Brexit, some things are going to change, and we are planning accordingly. The risk of a more adverse outcome than expected is one of the principal reasons why the government has to put in place careful measures in the case of a failure to reach any Brexit agreement. The measures include targeting a balanced budget over the cycle, including using windfall receipts to reduce public debt, rebuilding our budgetary buffers, including the establishment of a rainy day fund, increased capital expenditure, and a significant suite of measures to support SMEs that we have announced in previous budgets. In terms of other risks, I note the Committee's recommendation that the Government consider using fiscal policy to decrease our dependence on imported oil and gas. As an energy importer, we are of course adversely affected by increasing oil prices. However, the careful policies of recent years, I hope, have placed Ireland in a stronger position to deal with any shock which could materialise, including, of course, a shift in oil pricing. Reducing our public debt and its servicing costs remains a priority. Our current debt level equates to €42,000 per capita. It's the third highest in the developed world. That is why we remain steadfast in the pursuit of sound budgetary policy. Legislation has been drafted on the government's proposal for a rainy day fund. We are committed to initially seeding the fund with monies from the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund, as well as setting aside some of the high levels of corporate tax for the purpose of creating the fund. This means the risk of permanently increasing expenditure on the basis of transient receipts is reduced. With this in mind, a contribution of €500 million Euro to the Rainy Day Fund will be provided for next year, in addition to the £1.5 billion planned for this year too. The Government recognises the clear supply and affordability constraints in the housing market. In my previous two budgets, I introduced significant increases to both capital and current allocations of the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government. 
The capital budget has increased by 145 per cent since 2016 to over €1 billion, Euro, reflecting the Government's position that the only way to solve the current issues in the market over the long term is to build more homes, including social, housing, student accommodation and affordable homes and homes for people on average incomes. Since the measures introduced include the active allocation of €200 million Euro for the LIHA fund and the introduction and subsequent increase in the vacant site levy from three to seven for second and subsequent years. I also increased the rate of commercial stamp duty to help rebalance the construction industry. These and other measures are helping to boost supply. The latest figures from the CSO show a 34% increase in new home completions from last year. The number of planning permissions granted for residential development is now up 39%. But clearly we have some way to go and I will continue to work with Minister Murphy in the various initiatives his government, his department is engaged in. To touch on where we are from a fiscal point of view, 32.4 billion euro of tax revenues were collected, up 1.6 billion euro or 5 per cent on the same period versus last year were broadly on target, highlighting that our budgetary position is continuing to improve and we are closing in on a balanced headline budgetary position. Turning to expenditure, maintaining a sustainable public expenditure policy requires focus not only on the quantum of expenditure each year, but also on the quality of that expenditure. In tandem with the policy of sustainable current expenditure increases is the role of capital spending, how it can reduce risk and strengthen our economy. Indeed, I welcome the ESRI advice of today, highlighting the need for an overall approach to budgetary policy in this year's budget. I agree that given key infrastructural deficits in areas such as housing, along with the possibility of more adverse than expected outcome in the Brexit negotiations, that a non-contractionary budget is appropriate. That is why €1.5 billion Euro has been allocated towards increased capital investment, an increase of almost 25 per cent. This allocation will allow us to ensure a sustained increase in the delivery of social housing, offer additional school places and make progress on key projects. Systemic information about the efficiency and effectiveness of expenditure is crucial. Over the last number of years, our framework has undergone significant reform. Many initiatives are now in place that focus on what has been achieved by public spending. Underpinning this progress has been a number of structural reforms that support targeted improvements. The Committee has also made a number of recommendations. The aim of this process is to better embed an evaluation mentality in the public service with the goal of avoiding reactionary budgets and large annual shifts in expenditure. It should also maintain an ongoing evaluation of the effectiveness of existing levels of expenditure. Other structural reforms include performance and equality budgeting, including establishment of the Equality Budgeting Expert Advisory Group, which I know your committee has considered. We have made good progress in the area of climate proofing through tracking climate-related output targets in the annual REV and ex-post evaluation of climate-focused expenditure programmes. These reforms are aimed at increasing transparency and accountability. Ensuring, therefore, the implementation of Project Ireland 2040 is of the utmost importance to this Government. That's why we have published an expanded investment project and programme tracker. This builds on the work of the programme delivery board, which I've now met on a number of occasions. These include, uh, there are different projects they are working on include improving information flows for project monitoring, establishing the Land Development Agency, establishing the Construction Sector Group and progressing to four development funds. Addressing these issues will ensure that projects outlined in the NTB can be delivered on time and on budget and that the objectives set out in the NPF are achieved on a value for money basis. I note the Committee's recommendations that consideration be given to increase in carbon tax over a number of years. While I consider that carbon tax can play an important role 
in reducing national emissions, in any analysis of the carbon tax, it is also necessary to consider not just its potential to reduce emissions, but also other economic and social impacts. The ESRI, as part of its joint research programme with my department, has produced initial research in this, which will inform my decisions, and I am informed that it will be developing a multi-annual model for the same purpose. Finally, your committee's report makes a number of other recommendations that I will be duly considering. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today, Chairman, and I'll do my best to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, now, we have a number of people who have offered. Uh, the first deputy to offer was Deputy McGrath. Thank you very much, um, Cahir uh, Minister, you're very welcome, uh, and your officials. Uh, Minister, unless I missed it, I didn't see any reference in your opening remarks to health and uh, overspends in the HSE Department of Health. And what we have in terms of published information, we have the Exchequer Returns, or the Fiscal Monitor for the month of August, which shows up to the end of August, uh, current spending in health was €312 million Euro, um, over budget, overspent. Uh, we're reading reports in the media uh, that you informed Cabinet recently that the overrun could be 600 million, but we're also reading that the HSC believes it could be higher. Uh, 750 million has been mentioned, and even in a worst case scenario, uh, 1.1 billion of an overrun. So I think it's well past time we had clarity. So we have a published figure of just over 300 million of an overrun. Can you inform this committee? Where are we in relation to health spending in 2018, and what do you expect the outturn to be for the calendar year, and what's the impact of that, and how do you intend to address any overspend? So, uh, where we stand for the end of August, Deputy, is the overspend at the end of August was €343 million Euro on the HSE subheads. I want to reaffirm to you, Deputy, uh, what I said before the summer period which is that a supplementary estimate for the health vote will be needed. In terms of uh, what the final figure will be, I am still working on that with the Department of Health to clarify what that figure will be, because it will be a crucial input into my budgetary framework. I haven't made informed cabinets or elsewhere regarding what that figure will be, because the work is underway. But over the last number of years, we have brought in supplementary estimates of between five and six hundred million euro, uh, and I expect and know that nearer budget day, I will be able to confirm what that is. In terms of one of the key pieces that are uh, 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 requiring a lot of work for me at the moment, is much of it depends on the kind of activity that we expect to happen on the fourth quarter, and also where we're going to be in terms of planned recruitment. And all that work is still on the way in terms of what impact that will have on the budgetary position. Sorry. Just, I should have said this before you started. Just in, in keeping with what I've done in previous uh, meetings, I'm allocating about five minutes for an initial round per deputy asking questions and then coming back for more questions. So that has facilitated everybody uh, on, on previous occasions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So, Minister, just, just to recap, because this is critically important um, in terms of the budget and looking forward to next year, an overrun of €343 million, uh, by the HSE to the end of August. Uh, do you have a figure now as to what you estimate it to be for the full year, and how are you going to make up that shortfall? Is it going to be underspends elsewhere? Are we looking at cuts in services? Are we looking at stalling on capital expenditure? And if the overrun is, as suggested in some reports, likely to be up to a billion euro, then does it have a knock-on impact on budget 2019 if you can't make up that overspend uh, by way of underspends elsewhere or additional tax receipts that were unforeseen? So there are many different figures moving around, Deputy, regarding what it could be. What I'm very conscious of as Minister for Finance, though, is once I say what the figure is, that's the figure I'm accountable to the Oireachtas on, and that is the figure against which a supplementary estimate will be brought in. Uh, and uh, I am taking care with indicating what that figure is because I'm still in the middle of a lot of engagement with the Department of Health on it. To deal with the other questions that you have brought to me uh, in terms of how will that figure be paid for and then thirdly what would be the impact for next year. In terms of how that figure will be paid for, it will be a combination of uh, 
three different matters. Number one, it will be uh, underspends that we will have across other government departments, which are natural at the end of the budgetary year. Uh, and uh, they happen every year. They are likely to happen again this year. And we are dealing with that now as part of the bilateral engagement that I'm having with many other government departments. Secondly, where we expect to be with tax revenue, I will know where we're going to be with our uh, September figures clearly very soon. And at that point, then, I'll have to make a decision and a call regarding how we expect our October figures to land. And then thirdly, you know, as we move through the year, we do occasionally have slight buffers that are built in that allow for us to deal with difficulties as they develop. To answer your key question, Deputy, I am not intending, as we move through this, that I have to implement any decision that impacts on service delivery or on planned capital projects elsewhere. In terms of, finally, the one point I didn't touch on, sorry, in terms of what impact will I believe it will have for next year, um, as things stand at the moment, there are, look, there are many, many moving parts for the budget still, because the two decisions that will be made available to me for next week will be our final cut in relation to economic growth for next year. As you know, we always publish that as part of our budget documents on the day. And then, secondly, more than decision, actually, the information will be our best judgment regarding the tax outlook for the year. It doesn't make it easy for me to ensure the budgetary framework is going to be unchanged for next year, given the health pressure that I have, but I am working hard to ensure it is not changed from what I outlined in the summer economic statement, but I do have uh, at least a week further work in that area, Deputy. One further um, issue, Chair, um, and I can come back in later perhaps, but sure. on the issue of Brexit, um, Minister, the impact on our economy and on our budget of a no-deal scenario, and you speak about the baseline assumption being that there will be a transition period agreed up to the end of 2020, but if that doesn't happen, and that is a possibility that we have to be prepared mm -hmm. for, have you an assessment as Minister uh, as to what the impact will be on the Irish economy in 2019 and therefore on the budget for 2019 uh, on the scenario of the UK uh, crashing out of the European Union without any deal and without any transition period. Um, and then on a specific matter within that, the recruitment of customs and veterinary inspectors, I understand up to a thousand have been approved. Where are we at in that process and when do you expect additional people to be recruited? So in terms of your first question, uh, uh, are the figures that I have indicated to date is that a Brexit shock uh, in the form of either a very hard or a disorderly Brexit is equivalent to three quarters of a point to a full point of national income growth over a time period. My expectation is if we were to be faced with the vista of a disorderly Brexit, uh, that is a shock that would materialise over the year as opposed to over a number of years in relation to what would be the impact of that on the budget overall. To be frank, Deputy, it would just be one of a number of systemic issues that we would then need to deal with. But you're saying that in terms of the impact on the economy, it would reduce growth by up to 1% I, I, I can only next give you, year? I can only give you my judgment, yeah. okay, because this is a, 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 an event that clearly has many, many unknowns in relation to us were it to occur. But what we have said in the past is it's three quarters to a point in terms of what impact that would have on our uh, uh, budgetary framework. The answer is it would be very significant. Are you saying that it's the Department's assessment and yours as Minister that if the UK does crash out of the EU next March, that our economy would still grow by perhaps two or three percent next year instead of three or four percent. I think it is. is I, I think it is. I think it is likely that our economy would still grow, but it would be at a significantly lower rate. In terms of what we have said, in terms of the medium-term impact of a shock like that occurring, is that it could be worth three to three and a half growth points over the years afterwards. So th this is were that to occur. 
it would be a very significant shock for our economy. To answer your question then regarding what we can do uh, to uh, uh, kind of mitigate that and deal with it, I think there would be three areas we would immediately have to focus in on. Number one would be the budgetary impact, which I have given you an answer in, with all the caveats and conditions that I can, because it would be uh, uh, an event that would have many, many consequences. The second one would then be, of course, how we would respond, how we would deal with the exceptional swings that would be likely to occur in terms of the value of sterling with something like that to happen, which of course would have many, many difficult consequences for our trading economy. And then the third risk that we are working on would be what would be the impact that would have on our financial sector. Uh, because, as you will know, not only do we have banks that are active in the UK, of course we have uh, internet, we have uh, flows of money, we have insurance contracts, we have uh, exchanges between Ireland and the European Union, of which the UK is a member of. This is why, Deputy, in the uh, informal a uh, summit that took place in Bulgaria earlier on in the year, a working group is now in place between the Bank of England and the ECB to consider issues such as this. To answer your final question regarding where we are with recruitment, um, I understand we are in the early phases of that recruitment, but I'll see if I can furnish the Deputy more information in relation to that. That recruitment will obviously be funded by me in the budget, and I'll outline to the House how, I will be, how we will pay for that on budget day. Just one concluding point to make to you, Deputy, is that in any scenario along the Brexit spectrum, the UK is still becoming a third country. So to reiterate what I said at an event in IBEC there a number of days ago, um, uh, we are working hard to secure an outcome, but the trading relationship between the UK and the European Union will be changing. Uh, and that will then mean that there will be many new obligations on Irish, European and British companies. So the customs officials that we are hiring and what we are doing on the agricultural front, the additional staff that are being hired there will be needed. Thank you. Next year. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Doherty. <coughs> Minister, the, the summary economic statement uh, sets out the amount of discretionary spending that is available uh, to you in Budget 2019, and that was estimated at £800 million, given uh, that you weren't going to use uh, £900 million and putting half a billion into the rainy day fund. Uh, now, just less than two weeks out from Budget, uh, ha do you expect that figure to increase, decrease, or are you confident that that, will be, that figure will remain the same? I expect, Deputy, if there's any change on it, it will be a change around the margins. I'm not expecting a big increase in it, and were I to expect a, uh, a, a, a huge change in the budgetary framework, not only would it be apparent to all of you in terms of the growth forecast that we will publish, but uh, uh, you know, I would be informing colleagues of us. So okay. it will be a shift around the margin if that even occurs, occurs if okay. even that. Thank you. Um, I, I want to pick up on the issue of um, the health overrun. I'm quite surprised that you didn't mention it in, y in your open statement, uh, given the level of overrun that we're at at the minute and what is speculated. Uh, but I want to particularly focus in relation to how we deal with it for 2019. Uh, so is it the case that, and we'll use this just for argument's sake, that if, if there is a health overrun, well, maybe let me ask this question. If there's a health overrun of, of, of 600 million, or it could be 500 million, it could be less, it could be more, how much of that, what percentage of that, in your estimation, is recurring as opposed to one off? Well, that's actually one of the issues I'm working with the Department of Health on at the moment, because the key issue is not just the magnitude of any potential overrun, it's how much of that goes into the base. Yeah. My experience, to directly answer your question, Deputy, in dealing with matters such uh, uh, like this uh, in health expenditure is that a majority of that expenditure does go into the base. That's my understanding as well. And when we're looking at a majority, we're looking at in, in, in the in the in the range of close to 90 per cent or, or, or there thereabouts. Would that be your understanding also? Um, a bit less at times. One of the variables tends to be, for example, what happens in relation to the state claims agency or what happens in relation to capital expenditure. But as I said, it is a majority uh, of that expenditure. But that's a key thing then for what impacts then my budget 19 calculations. 
So, if if we are to 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 believe what what is being put out there in in the media that the the uh, overspend at this point in time projected for the end of the year is is likely to be just in excess of 600 million, with the vast majority of that recurring. That means that the health budget would need to increase by that amount, plus obviously the amount to deal with demographics and inflation just to stand still. Uh, is that what the US Minister will be announcing on Budget Day, that the, recurring, the full recurring amount, which will be calculated, I assume, by the Department of Health, uh, will be put into the base along with the other uh, components which deals with demographic uh, changes. That's correct, Deputy. That's why I have to put so much focus into understanding out of that expenditure how much of it will be repeated into 19. But okay. the framework that you've just outlined is correct. So, again, I just want to tease it out using indicative uh, figures. So if we're looking at uh, a £600 million overrun and saying that over 80 per cent of it is, is recurring, that's about half a billion that would have to go into the base. How, is it, how would that be dealt with? Is that just a case of if there is only eight hundred million in discretionary spending available in budget two thousand and nineteen is it just the automatic conclusion that that spending is now reduced from eight hundred to, to three hundred using those indicative figures? No, so what we would do is I would look at the end of the year regarding uh, what uh, the uh, revised and final expenditure figure would be for two thousand and eighteen. And I would then decide for 2019 how much of the additional expenditure of that goes into the base for 19, uh, and then how much of that is going to be covered by tax revenue that I can make a determination of is likely to continue into 19 as well. And the delta between the two of them will then influence the degree to which it at all in, uh, influences budget 19 choices. And, and so the and obviously, if there is no tax revenue, then you know that hasn't been already identified. Then it, it has to come out of the 800 million discretionary funding. Uh, uh, or, well, no, it could influence other, other budgetary choices that I make as well. I've always said, deputy, that there are uh, choices that I can make in relation to the overall budgetary stance for the budget. Uh, that might require tax changes yeah, elsewhere. Of course, a discretionary revenue increases. So, in relation to tax revenue at this point in time, where is it projected uh, to come in at the end of the year? And obviously, we know that where some of that, that buoyancy is coming from is corporation tax. And do you genuinely believe, and it would be astonishing if you did, that we should be funding underspending in health by a, a buoyancy in, in corporation tax receipts that I think everybody in this committee knows that there's a, a genuine likelihood that they may not present in, in a number of years in the same level. Yeah, uh, th this is a matter that I will be looking at later on uh, in the next few days because we are seeing now across a number of tax headings we've seen a really strong performance. We're seeing it in relation to taxes relating to the labour market and we're also seeing it in relation to corporation tax. Uh, and I will have to make uh, an adjudication next week to what degree any of that is sustainable for 19. That will then, in turn, then uh, what will uh, 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 how much of this is likely to go into the base. But the other thing that's going to happen, Deputy, will be having a look at where we are in other government departments and savings that come out of other government departments that are also likely to carry forward into next year. Because this is what we're doing, government department by government department. We're not looking at where they told us they were going to end up at the end of 2018. We're now looking at where we believe they're going to end up at the end of 2018. And that is a fundamental thing then in influencing what my base is going to be for next year. Okay. Can I ask you... Can I just flag to you one minute left? Okay. Sorry. Well, if, two, two, two small questions. I'll put both of them together. Um, in my experience, the small questions are sometimes the trickiest. Uh, so if you put them together... Well, you can I'm tell not sure it will make it any easier for me. Or not. You can tell me afterwards. Um, it, it, look, we know that the health overrun is mostly, mostly done up in recruitment. It's, it's, it, it's, it suggests a time and time again that this was predictable, it was demand-led. We've had the, uh, the HSE here before the Health Committee, before the Budgetary Committee have, pre have, have presented all this. How come you've got the, the health budget so wrong? Uh, like this isn't a minor uh, amount of money that the health budget has overrun again. You've basically underfunded health in last year's budget, something that I m made a point of saying to you uh, on budget day. Uh, and the second issue is that you mentioned that there is a 
1.5 billion euro increase in capital investment. Obviously, the housing crisis is, is a huge crisis with um, massive um, implications for those uh, in the middle of that crisis. I, I've made the point before, it, it's man-made, it's not a natural disaster, it's because of your government policies that you underfund uh, social and affordable housing. But is it not the case that of the 1.5 billion euro that only 200 million has been identified for um, housing? Uh, or could you tell me whether you have revised those figures and intend to increase the amount of capital, uh, additional capital going into housing in Budget 2019? So, for, to deal with the, your first question, Deputy, uh, uh, did I knowingly uh, uh, underfund the health service? Uh, the answer to that question is no. Uh, I made decisions uh, which I take responsibility for that I worked on with the Department of Health. What is a, uh, an issue for us uh, is the fact that we are seeing overspends uh, developing on both pay and non-pay areas, and much of this is concentrated within our acute hospital groups. The, and gen the General Secretary wrote sorry, within, within weeks, sorry, just a, a, a small point, the General Secretary wrote within weeks saying that there was going Chairman, to be an overrun. Chairman, I'll Chairman, I'll finish yeah, off answering okay. the question, yeah, okay. but I am available. Yeah, I will spend okay. the afternoon here to answer the questions that you have, Deputy. Uh, what is compounding that, uh, Deputy Doherty, is that our uh, expectations in relation to income that were coming into our hospitals, that expectation has not been met as well. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a lot of work to do now, uh, which we are in the process of completing, for understanding fully what that is and what the impacts will be for Budget 2019. In relation to your latter question, Deputy, in relation to housing, the, um, uh, the housing uh, budget overall, as part of uh, uh, rebuilding Ireland and the National Development Plan, allocates a further 7.5 billion euro for uh, uh, social housing, and for the housing budget for 2018, it is a figure of 1.8 billion euro which is 38% higher than the provisional outturn in 2017. To answer your final question, uh, will the amount of money that is available for housing in next year's budget go up? The answer to that question is yes. And maybe while I'm answering... That, was, that wasn't the question. No, 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 Deputy, I'm, was, was no, 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 Deputy I'm going to come on okay, and answer your sorry, question. Okay. So, look, you put a question to me, I'm going to answer no. it. The particular question then you asked me was the degree to which we've already committed higher funding for housing for next year as part of Ireland 2040 and the National Development Plan. Uh, we have committed additional funding for us. I don't have the figure in front of me here, but maybe my officials in the course of the uh, uh, answering other questions can get it for me and I'll share it with you, Deputy. I have a pretty good idea what the figure is, but given the sensitivity of the matter, I want to give you the right one uh, and I'll give that to you later on in the hearing. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy. I just want to, just on an overview, just so as we know where we are in re relation to this. Currently, I have um, Deputy O'Brien about to start, then Deputy Bruin, Deputy Boyd Barish, Deputy um, Chambers, Deputy Cowan, and Deputy Burton. So, if you can bear with me, that's why I'm being very direct on time today. When everybody has had an opportunity to come in for a single um, opportunity of questioning, if we have time still left in the meeting, obviously we can do a follow-up. Uh, Deputy O'Brien, you're up next again. Thank you. Just in relation to the, the health overspend, why are we not able to predict it? You have said that uh, one of the drivers is the acute hospital sector. But we know that... We know that every year, because for the last five years, the acute hospital sector has been the area where we have seen that overspend. Uh, so, what, what is the difficulty, Minister, in actually predicting the, the, the drivers within the overspend? Well, Deputy, we make assumptions every year in relation to how that vote is going to perform. The challenge that we have is the uh, 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 overspend is of a level that is higher than we have seen before uh, and uh, much of that is uh, attributed to what we're seeing happening in the acute hospital group. I made uh, decisions in relation to the allocation of funding for that and uh, as the year has went on it has been obvious that uh, the demand in relation to those parts of our health services uh, has grown. 
and I'm going to have to deal with the consequences of this uh, as part of Budget 19, which I will be doing, and I'll be explaining how I will fund us uh, on Budget Day. In relation to the overspend in the acute hospital sector, are you concerned that quarter four of the year is always the quarter where you see a significant increase? Uh, yes, I am. And uh, this is why I'm taking care in relation to naming the figure, because there is a lot of debate underway and views in relation to what it is. But once I put a figure to this committee, deputy accounts change because that's the figure then that goes into a supplementary estimate. And one of the reasons I'm taking care now in concluding my work with Deputy with Minister uh, uh, Simon Harris is what you said is correct, that normally when we get into the fourth quarter, in particular recruitment in the fourth quarter, has accelerated in the past, and then that becomes a consequence then for Budget 2019 for the reasons that Deputy Doherty asked me about because that then carries forward into 2019. And what steps are the department taking to ensure that we're not in the same place next year? Uh, we're trying to get a balance right, Deputy, because we have commitments overall in relation to recruitment for the year that we want to be met. And I want to ensure that any decisions that we make in relation to this year uh, don't affect service provision, uh, given the great distress that can cause um, uh, for our vulnerable citizens. Can I just touch on housing now? Um, what is the reason that the Department have made a decision not to go above the uh, figures in terms of planned house, house building, um, which was set out in the uh, capital plan? Is there a particular reason why we're not spending more on housing given the crisis? Do you mean beyond what I've already indicated, yes. Deputy? The only reason why we haven't uh, made a decision beyond that yet is because it's a consequence of the budgetary process. So if we make a decision in relation to the provision of more social affordable homes and home hubs, we have to make a resource decision in relation to us, and that's been done at the moment in the budget, and it's not complete yet. So if we were to make such a decision, that would then change the housing figures that you're referring to. Okay. And would you agree that the, if we ramped up house, house construction, that it doesn't pose a risk to overheating the economy? I think there's a balance that we have to get right, Deputy. I thought it was interesting what the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council said about this. They said there is a degree to which, if house building goes beyond a certain level, in a certain time period, it can pose a risk to the economy. But as against that, there's two things. <coughs> Firstly, the lack of housing at a certain level also poses challenges for uh, uh, businesses and their role in our economy. But secondly, and I need hardly tell you this, the, uh, the social and personal difficulty that has been caused by the lack of homes weighs very heavily upon me and I need to get that balance right. And if we make a decision that we're going to put additional resources into the economy uh, to provide more social homes, I may decide that that is paid for out of additional measures, which of themselves can have an effect on the economy that can offset the inflationary risk that you're referring to. Uh, but what is uh, uh, uppermost in my mind is the... Uh, great difficulty that tenants, people who are homeless, people who are concerned about their future face, Deputy, and I'm trying to navigate my way towards doing that. Just one final point I'd make to you is, you know, uh, a way in which I try to use a tax measure to affect the composition of our overall economy is what we did in relation to stamp duty and commercial property last year, where we put more money in certain areas, but by increasing stamp duty and commercial property, it played a role in kind of uh, uh, dealing with inflationary pressures that were beginning to develop in that sector a year ago. And IFAC have actually identified that sector as the area which is posing the greatest uh, risk to overheating uh, in their um, heat chart which they provided in their budget. Uh, they have, and the chairman of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, Seamus Coffey, has always been consistent in a point 
which is that we could get to a level of house building that could itself pose a risk to the economy. I don't believe we are at that point yet. And as I said to you a moment ago, the social consequences of the right level of homes being available, I know are immense. I have to respond back to that. And if we were to decide to put more resources into homes and having them built, there are many options that are open to me regarding how we could pay for it and things that we could do that might mitigate the, the effect of the construction of those homes on the economy. Uh, and they affect what we could do on a tax level. They also refer to how we might allocate money between different government departments. Okay. And finally, so I'll come back in sure. and go into more detail on the questions sure. in the second round. Just in relation to the rainy day fund, can you give us uh, some more detail on what type of rainy day fund you're proposing and what um, discussions you've had um, with the EU in relation to the establishment of, or the Commission in relation to the establishment of the Rainy Day Fund? Thanks, uh, Deputy. So, the, uh, uh, the, uh, my intention in relation to it is unchanged from what I said in the summer economic statement in relation to seed funding of €1.5 billion Euro, and then additional funding of half a billion euro in relation to engagement that I've had with the European Union and the uh, Commission. Uh, it's been very positive. Positive in the sense that if we want to access the Rainy Day Fund, there is no issue. I think they will be happy, Deputy, that the triggers that we have laid out in relation to how that funding would be accessed, they uh, currently understand the rationale for us. And I, th that's not me, Chairman. So, um, uh, 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 Unless it's my iPad. Okay. Yeah. Seems to have. Sorry. Sure. And there is flexibility within the stability growth pact and growth pact regarding the kind of conditions that uh, an economy could develop that would allow the release of funding. The Commission would see the rainy day fund, and I know there is differing views on it here in the committee, but they would see it as an example of the kind of uh, budgetary resilience that we should be trying to build up at this point in our economic cycle. What kind of conditions? I mean, are we talking about like in events of natural disasters, once-off uh, events that we can access it? Uh, is it also not true, Minister, um, that if we wanted to access spending from the Rainy Day Fund over and above the expenditure benchmark, that that would be against the fiscal rules? Currently. Okay, well, I'll answer the first part of your question, then I might ask you to clarify the second part of it in terms of what are the, uh, the criteria upon which funding could be accessed. The answer to that is the terminology they use is severe economic shocks or natural disasters, uh, and it would be kind of up to us to be able to define what they are. And what I have proposed in relation to this is this is something that should be a vote of. The uh, cabinet should be a, a cabinet decision, but also something that should be subject to debate within the Doyle. And you, you might just talk me through your second question again, just okay. so I answer accurately. So, in terms of the expenditure benchmark, yep. if we wanted to spend over and above what we would be allowed or what would be uh, recommended in terms of the expenditure benchmark, and we wanted to access the Rainy Day Fund in order to do that, is that permissible under the current fiscal rules? Uh, no, I would have to raise revenue in order to do that. Okay. Thank you very much, yeah. Deputy Brown. Deputy Bruin. Yeah, thanks. I just want to welcome the Minister and the officials. Um, is it the case, Minister, that uh, you're considering going down the Charlie McCreevy road and introducing a special savings scheme? Is, is consideration being given to that to dampen down overheating? Um, unlike you, who, uh, who never seem to have money for necessary spending, I think Mr McCreevy used to say, when I have it, I spend it. But um, are you thinking of a special savings scheme? No. That, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, what about, uh, can I move on then, to, uh, to uh, the, uh, the uh, lo long debate we've had about VAT uh, <laughs> in relation to uh, the 9%, etc. Now, just your own department, I mean, were you impressed by, by the, um, studies, the study of your own department, which didn't seem to find huge um, arguments in favour of retaining 9%? 
So uh, I, I have been impressed by the cases that have been put forward by both sides of the debate in relation to this. As you know, the protocol in relation to tax strategy group papers is that their views of the department rather than me as minister, and they inform choices that I make. But clearly, I've also met uh, representatives of the Irish hospitality sector and accommodation sector who hold diametrically opposing view. And as a former Minister for Tourism, I'm aware of why they hold those views. Uh, but I think at this point, Deputy, if I was to give you an indication of – I can't give you an indication of what I'm planning to do, uh, because I'm, I'm still in the throes of looking at what likely expenditure is going to be next year and then deciding how we pay for it. And if I begin to comment on any tax measure here today, we won't have a budget. Well, actually, this morning at um, Leaders' Questions, the Taoiseach gave us a kind of a broad outline of the budget. Uh, he said it's going to be sort of three pillars. Uh, I think it was um, balance, generally in balance, a big investment capital programme, and then tax cuts for the squeeze middle. Um, so he gave us a flavour in response, I have to say, to Deputy Howland's um, questions about um, you know, the, the, the top earners and their tax rates. I mean, can we take it, though, that uh, – and this committee has spent a lot of time talking about tax expenditures. Um, you know, and, and trying to estimate, uh, with, with the help of the, the budgetary office, trying to estimate the vast size of tax expenditures. So you're coming along now with new tax expenditures, and I mean, can we take it that though, whatever tax cuts the Taoiseach and you are thinking about or, or finalising, that these are going to be somehow sustainable? For example, I mean, the, uh, reven or the revenue told us, I think, a few months ago that if we had a 43% tax rate, for example, top rate, which uh, a number of us have, have you know, proposed in the past, uh, that it would raise you know, almost upwards towards half a billion uh, euro. So can we take it, though, if, if, uh, and if you make changes in CAT and, and other changes, there are some, some things in the you know, committee reports and agreed report, but uh, I, I wouldn't agree with some of those changes, but that, that it's going to be sustainable and that you're not going to hand on a poison chalice. And I mean, it's always, obviously, yourselves and Fianna Fáil are working out this budget uh, together, but can we take it that, that th those changes will be sustainable? Any changes that we make are going to be sustainable and are going to be affordable and uh, will be in line uh, with the kind of changes that we made last year. I mean, you, you kind of began to begin the journey there of you know, what I'm planning to do in relation to expenditure. But I mean, if you look at what I'm doing, Deputy, the key driver of where we are with expenditure growth next year is investment in capital expenditure. It's hospitals, it's schools, it's homes. I think you agree with me on all of that. If I look at where we are in current expenditure, notwithstanding the, uh, the pressure that we have on the health sector, which I've touched on, much of the expenditure growth that we have elsewhere is either, well, with, with, with one other exception, is nearly on profile, and that rate of current expenditure growth is in line with how the economy is growing. And, you know, if, if the, to deal with the charge that I'm, you know, in some way looking to be unsustainable, to illustrate the scale of how different we are now versus where we were in the past, in budgets that were um, uh, deployed across the period of the so-called Tiger, the combined value of the tax and social welfare packages across that period um, at one point were between 1.6 and 2.6 billion euro. The combined value of any package that I've put in front of the Doyle has been between 800 million euro and a billion euro at max. So in terms of both expenditure <coughs> growth and income and social welfare packages, they are of a magnitude lower than where we were in the past. And I, you know, I, I would have, uh, and then in terms of you know, what the Taoiseach said, like he offered a broad outline, which he's correct on regarding where we are going, uh, uh, and what I will be doing now uh, you know, before Budget Day is filling all that out. And just a final question in relation to, um, can we take it away from what you just said then, that on Budget Day, on um, whatever it is, Tuesday week, that um, there will be an, in, in a, a gender equality budget statement beside the budget that, that, you'll, that you'll also read out. And uh, that, that proposal, obviously, uh, this committee has done a lot of work in, in this area, in support, I think, and, and I know that Deeper has been, obviously, have, have its own programme, etc., as well. Um, um, so will you be doing that and perhaps responding to the committee's report on, on gender budgeting? And will you be using the ESRI's switch model 
to evaluate whatever this budget is going to be um, before you stand up? So, uh, number one, um, uh, we will be publishing, uh, I will be making reference to where we are with equality, with equality proofing and equality budgeting on budget day. I think to manage your expectations at this point, we won't be in a place where we can extend that approach to all government expenditure. We're not there yet. Where we are at the moment, Deputy, is we have work underway now in relation to six specific areas that we are equality proofing, in relation to education, business, transport, culture, health and children and youth affairs. And in the aftermath of the budget, in the REV that we will be publishing, which is the revised estimates uh, volume, we will include in that an update on where we are in equality budgeting and gender proofing of budgets um, in, in, in those or maybe other specific areas. We are working with the uh, working group in relation to uh, equality uh, budgeting, which is the expert advisory group. Uh, and we have a good work plan <coughs> laid out regarding how we're going to make this work come alive across the coming year. And I think that some of the experts who have been in front of you might have acknowledged we're trying to work to make this happen, and we are. It's a bit disappointing, though, Minister, that, that, that there isn't such a, you know, such a statement, or, you know, at, le at least it's not in the, in the, 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 you know, the big volume itself, um, and that we're not more proactive on that. Um, and in relation to, to, to the switch model, uh, which sure. we've heard you know, can be utilised, um, again, it, it, uh, you know, it clearly is something like we've liaised with the Scottish Parliament, uh, with other uh, jurisdictions, that, that have embarked on this course, um, and um, perhaps it's something then you need to make a priority. No, to answer that question, Deputy, uh, we do a, a switch model ourselves. I should have said that to you in answering your question. It's done internally. Uh, uh, so we do uh, look at what are the distributional consequences of decisions that we make. It's fair to say now it wouldn't be of the level of sophistication that the ESRI then publish. And the, the most uh, kind of the, the leaders in switch analysis uh, is the ESRI and Professor Tim Callan, who's recently retired uh, from that work. Uh, so they will be doing their work. We have a model, but it wouldn't have the full weight of what they have. Uh, and obviously, we'll have to make lots of different decisions that then at the, fi at the final moment feed into the switch analysis. In relation to your disappointment about where we are in gender proofing and, uh, and equality budgeting, uh, I take your point, but I, it, would be, it's, it would be a big ask to be able to do this for all of government expenditure. And we think where we're going to end up in relation to this um, is going to at least be in line with what other countries are doing at the moment. We think there's around 90 countries across the OECD who are doing this work. The leader of this work is in Austria. In fact, I met the Austrian finance minister before I came here. And I, I think the work we will put in front of you will be a kind of substantial work in relation to particular government departments, but we have a bit to go yet before we can do it for every cent that we are spending. Deputy Boyd Barrett. Thanks. Uh, and thanks to the Minister and his officials. Uh, Minister, one narrative that uh, is, I often kind of identify with you and indeed uh, your Fine Gael uh, predecessors is that your prudent uh, you're pragmatic, whereas some of us on the left are um, uh, reckless and uh, if, if, profligate, exactly. <laughs> now, I, I want to put it to you that the opposite is the truth, and I want, to, I want you to answer questions in two particular areas uh, where I think you're being reckless, profligate, uh, and uh, wasting uh, and planning to waste large amounts of public money that could be far better spent solving some of the very serious problems this country faces. So let's start with housing, the biggest uh, problem that we face. <clears throat> Apart from the social crisis that uh, is engulfing the country, and everybody, by the way, the ESRI, the latest to say this is going to get worse, not better, after seven years of Fine Gael government. But aside from that social crisis, um, can I put it to you that your uh, Rebuilding Ireland plan is, is, is proposing to waste, in a very profligate way, enormous amounts of money, um, something that 
uh, is more or less confirmed in the IGIS report. We've been saying it for years, but the Spending Review 218, IGIS from the Department of Public Expenditure, okay? Uh, where they set out the Rebuilding Ireland targets, pointing out that of 137,000 social housing units, uh, only 33,000 of those will be billed, uh, 6,000 acquisition, and the rest will be leasing, that's current expenditure, uh, and RAS, uh, current expenditure, and HAPS, current expenditure. Okay, so uh, 137,000, uh, just under 100,000 of the proposed units are going to be ongoing current expenditure that is going to increase and increase and increase, as against what the report points out, is when you do construction and acquisition, actually the current expenditure will decrease over time. Uh, you might have a bigger upfront capital cost, uh, but over time, uh, the cost to the exchequer, the ongoing cost, will reduce. So why are you doing this utterly profligate, reckless uh, uh, type of spending, uh, which is going to create a massive hole in the public finances uh, over, uh, uh, over the future? And in relation to your point about inflation, surely this is also going to fuel inflation, uh, because you're proposing a, a social housing provision model where we will have no control over the costs uh, of the delivery of that housing, over the price uh, that will be charged by the private sector uh, in terms of property prices and rents, which we can see are spiralling as those private sector people are manipulating the market. Uh, isn't that an absolute guarantee to see massive inflation in the housing sector and repeat all the mistakes of uh, the past? The second area I want you to respond to uh, is on the area of tax reliefs, where I, again, I think you're being absolutely profligate, uh, no prudence whatsoever uh, in the uh, massive uh, uh, outflow of tax expenditures, tax reliefs and tax allowances, which I don't think are being monitored, reviewed, uh, but are being abused. Let me take the most obvious example that's li linked to housing. I have asked on successive occasions, this is the Budget Scrutiny Committee, Section 1110 Relief, which is a relief, so the public knows, which means that people who bought into Irish property, bought into Irish property, if they uh, retain their investment for, I think, it's seven years, will pay no capital gains tax and no tax on uh, rental income. And when we ask how much tax is foregone on that relief, which has fueled the vulture funds grab of Irish property, we cannot get an answer. Now, do you not think the public and this committee at least deserves an answer about how much tax is being uh, foregone on Section 1110? Could we have an answer? Uh, I know you don't agree. I would agree with the financial transaction tax, but could you give an answer to how much would, uh, revenue would be generated if we imposed an FDT? Uh, and could you uh, examine things like, for example, Section 481 tax relief? And let me stress, I think we need lots more investment in film, but for example, Mel Gibson is suing producers of a film made in this, in this country because he alleges that uh, expenses uh, for that film were being uh, inflated sorry, in order to defraud Section 481 sorry, tax sorry, relief. Sorry, sorry, definitely. But I'm finished. You, know, you finished, but you went way outside what you should have uh, uh, said in terms of uh, your, your comments. Uh, Minister. Well, actually, I was going to say that I don't think you're reckless and profligate, no, Deputy, because uh, you put forward costed ideas uh, regarding how you would fund expenditure. My view is the proposals that you put forward regarding how you would pay for uh, the expenditure would ruin our economy. Uh, I don't think you're being profligate. I just think the ways you have of paying for these policies would cause devastation to jobs being created and retained in Ireland. That's different from being profligate. Uh, 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 but given that, look, to deal with the different questions that you've put to me there, Firstly, in relation to uh, the point that you've made there in relation to the composition of our housing policy, you're, you're incorrect in what you say. Up to 2021, we're looking to provide an additional 50,000 social housing homes, of which 33,500 would be built, 6,500 would be acquired, and 10,000 leased. So that's the makeup of us up to 2021. In relation to why we are using leasing what about, what programs, about the in, in relation, in sorry, relation, the sorry, in, in, in relation, to, in relation to why finished. we are using uh, leasing and why we are using RAS programs, we are using those programs 
our social housing output builds up to where we want it to build up. What's the alternative to doing it? Do you think it would be tenable for me to say, while homes are being built, we won't give support to people who need it? That would be wrong. So while we are getting our social housing output up to where we need it to get to, we are using these programmes in order to ensure that people who need support in having a roof over their head and they deserve it, that they get it. In relation to your question about uh, 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 FTT, uh, I, I don't have an answer as to uh, what it would be, uh, but I will get it for you. I know this is an issue you've raised in the past. But again, this is, a, this is an example of why I don't believe your policies are unconstant. I just genuinely believe they would have caused huge harm to our economy. I believe if we were to bring an FTT in, as kind of glamorous as it sounds uh, from afar, it would have an immediate effect on the financial services sector in Ireland that employs tens of thousands of people. Um, we would practically find ourselves in a situation where we would be an outlier in having something like that implemented, which at a time in which the only silver lining that's available to our economy is where we might end up in a financial services perspective post-Brexit, again would harm jobs, the creation and the retention of them. Sorry, Section no, 110, no, you didn't answer. Section 110, you didn't answer. Uh, in relation to Section 110, uh, I, I don't have an answer for no, you here in front I of know. me. I know, that's what I, I want to I, know. When I, we get an answer? I have to say, my, my recollection of what you said to me is you, didn't, you, you moved quickly on to where we are on FTT. Um, if that information is available, Deputy, I don't have it to hand. If it's available, I'll get it and I'll send it over to you. Thank you, Deputy Boyd Barish. Deputy Chambers. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister, for your attendance today. I want to focus on the area of Brexit, and I know you've, you've outlined a number of measures uh, in your statement, which, by the way, we only received with 14 minutes before this meeting commenced, so it would have been preferable to get it a little bit sooner, actually. Um, but just in terms of the, the sector-specific um, supports that you're going to put in place, um, I think the events of Salzburg last week have raised more concerns in terms of the, the potential for a no-deal Brexit, and I understand we are preparing for that possible eventuality and obviously hoping that it doesn't happen. But even in, terms of, um, even in terms of getting a deal, even if we have a free trading arrangement with the UK, we are still looking at a drop in GDP. If I'm going on the Copenhagen Economics Report, we're still looking at a drop in GDP of up to 4%. We're looking at our exports reducing by 3.5%. If we look at World Trade Organization rules and if the UK revert to that, we're looking at exports going down by 7%, uh, a loss in wages of nearly 9%. So there's huge potential risks to our economy in the very near future. And while I welcome the fact that you've acknowledged that it is increasing our fiscal buffers to have a rainy day fund, which is Fianna Fáil policy, and that's where we have a rainy day fund, that's a kind of a longer term strategy. Um, we have Brexit next year. And I'm particularly concerned around the agri-food sector, which stands to be most affected. I met with Enterprise Ireland yesterday, and they're doing a lot of work in terms of um, helping Irish companies to diversify their markets. But even they will acknowledge that not every uh, product uh, will be uh, as able to move markets as others. Um, one of the areas we outlined were beef, mushrooms, so again, agri-food. Um, in terms of beef, we are looking at a potential drop in exports, even just with a free trading arrangement of up to 18%. And dairy, we are looking at up to 18%. As well. So huge impacts on our agri agri agricultural sector and agri-food sector. Uh, I, and I'm sure many other deputies, met with the IFA today, and they are looking for specific supports in this budget, uh, in particular €200 Euros, uh, per suckler cow, and also access to, to low-cost credit. I think, Minister, there needs to be a specific focus on the sectors that will be most affected. Even with, the, even with minor changes, these sectors will be massively affected. Um, so I would ask you, Minister, what plans have you in terms of sector-specific supports, particularly with agri-food? And also, will you publish details of your contingency planning for a no-deal Brexit? I have submitted an FY request on behalf of the party. It was rejected and it was appealed and rejected again. So I'm asking, can you give us that information as to what your contingency planning is for a no-deal Brexit? Okay. In relation to three questions, um, um, uh, I'm pleased to be able to tell you, Deputy, that actually across the period to date, uh, sales of Irish food and drink and agriculture has increased by 6% versus a year ago. So amidst the kind of change that we are seeing, uh, we are seeing an industry that continues to do well. In terms of future supports that I might put against it, that would be the outcome of the budgetary process that I'm in the middle of. 
but I can point to you what I've already done. What have I done in relation to it? We've done three particular measures. Firstly, uh, we've looked to put more uh, resource and support behind organisations like on board BIA to allow them to continue with the work that uh, uh, they are doing in uh, targeting overseas markets. Secondly, we put in place a uh, loan fund earlier on in the year to make uh, working capital available uh, to farmers who are looking at how they can diversify their business. And then thirdly, uh, I've been work working with Minister Creed in relation to uh, particular matters for his department to uh, uh, try to deal with them. So, for example, last year, we made additional funding available for uh, particular programmes in the RDP in relation to uh, sheep farming, all of which had an effect on the uh, performance of Irish agriculture. In relation to your last question there regarding can I publish details in relation to contingency planning, I mean, the reason why you're, well, firstly, I didn't know you had put in an FOI request, nor should I. I wasn't involved in the decision-making process in relation to it, nor should I be. Uh, this, is an entirely, this is a matter that's entirely independent of me. But I imagine one of the reasons why is that uh, there is a, a kind of provision within the Freedom of Information legislation in relation to the deliberative process that's underway sometimes within government in reaching decisions. And uh, you know, work that we might publish in relation to contingency planning my outlining but that would be will have two immediate effects. The first immediate effect that will have deputy is it will affect the negotiations that we have that are underway at the moment. And I think we should think carefully about doing anything that might undermine what are incredibly sensitive negotiations. And uh, secondly, uh, laying out uh, uh, exactly how we plan to manage worst case scenarios in very sensitive areas in relation to our economy. Um, are best done at a point in which I can uh, absolutely demonstrate that they're needed and it's important to talk to the country about. Um, I've outlined earlier on in speaking to Deputy McGrath what would be the effect of a disorderly Brexit. I can just give you a view that it's so cushioned in uncertainty regarding what that effect would be. It would be a major disruption for the Irish economy. And to me, for me to outline how we would deal with it could undermine work we have underway. Uh, that's really sensitive at the moment. Uh, thank you, Mr. I mean, I would disagree with you. I think everybody is aware that every member state is making preparations for all possible eventualities. I think outlining those details isn't going to undermine or negatively affect the negotiations in any way, is my view on it. But uh, I'll move on. I just want to. First, um, in the area of VAT, I appreciate you won't give me an answer today, but just to make the case uh, for West of Ireland businesses, for rural businesses, um, it is quite different across the regions. And I would ask you to bear that in mind that, yes, we are businesses that are doing very well in the capital, but if you go to a hotel or a restaurant in County Mayo or anywhere along the western seaboard, it is a different story. We're not all doing the same. And that regional imbalance needs to be reflected in budgetary policy. Uh, I've appreciated that you've said that that cannot be different for different areas, but other mechanisms can be employed to try and rebalance things. So I'd ask you to bear that in mind. And my final question, Minister, you've dealt with the overrun in the health budget um, from other questions from other deputies. An area that I want to touch upon is the area of orphan drugs. Um, every year new drugs become available for different ailments um, but the health budget is expected to respond to that out of the existing budget. There isn't a specific budget for orphan drugs and I'd ask you, thank you Chairman, I'd ask you to, to look at that with the Minister for Health that if we know these are going to come down the line every year and we have families and children outside the gates of Leinster House protesting and asking for medication that they believe they need. Uh, there should be a separate budget to deal with this type of event because we know it happens every year almost and the health budget cannot be expected to deal with the unexpected uh, of that, uh, that magnitude. So I'd ask Minister that you'd, you'd sit down with your Minister for Health uh, and see what can be done to try and deal with something that we know will, will be an annual thing uh, and not put that pressure on families to have to try and compete um, with a health budget that is already massively overrun and seems as though we're going to continue on that process. So, Deputy, in relation to your uh, first question there, uh, we will be as prepared as uh, uh, you can be for dealing with the different developments that occur next year. And as somebody who is involved in the discussions that are underway in relation to us, I respectfully take a different view to you. Um, I believe uh, we, we could get to a point in which we need to 
uh, articulate what we're going to do if certain con developments occur. Um, I don't believe it would be helpful for us to do that now. Uh, in relation to your second question that you put to me there regarding the VAT raise, understand that point very well. It's a point that's been put to me by Minister Ring. It's a point that's been put to me by Minister Ross and Minister Griffin. But if you look at the third point that you then made to me regarding the need to pay for new drugs, mm -hmm. we have to raise the money to pay for those new drugs, I uh, Deputy. And I, I, I know you understand that. And ultimately, we will have to make choices regarding how we do all of that. I know you will feel as strongly as I do regarding further progress that we need to make in relation to how we deal with housing. If you stand by the adherence to the fiscal rules, which I know your party does, that will mean we have to make choices regarding how we pay for resources that become available beyond what I announced in the summer economic statement. And there are no easy choices left regarding how we do it. And uh, uh, that's what I'm uh, reflecting on at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, okay, thank you Deputy Chambers. Uh, Deputy Cowan. Thanks, Chairman. Um, I just want to come back to this health, and I know there's been quite a few questions on it, but just so as there's absolute certainty in relation to it, despite the fact I know that you've said it'll be a week before you can make a, a final decision as to the implications of an overrun based on the information that will emanate at that time. Um, but you said earlier, you know, based on previous years, it could be in the region of five to six hundred million, okay, and that there has been uh, supplementaries to that tune previously. You also said that there would be no implication for the eight hundred million that is available in the overall package because of expected excess revenue from tax because of underspends in other departments. So without knowing the health figure, do you at this juncture have an estimate as to what the excess tax income would be? And do you have a figure for the underspends across other departments? And more importantly, can you inform us what departments are underspending? What departments gave a commitment to the taxpayer and failed to live up to that obligation or that expectation? Because I think the public would be interested to know uh, where these underspends have occurred and why, they've un why, why they have occurred, especially when you consider the demands that's been placed upon us as public representatives in relation to our obligations, in relation to critical infrastructure like rural roads and county roads, amongst other things. You hear you know, all the various representations from different sectors and uh, those advocating on their behalf that are meeting with deputies throughout the House over the last number of weeks and indeed the next number of weeks. But also, in relation to carbon tax, say, you know, together with the SRI and others, you're evaluating a mechanism by which uh, a cohesive approach can be taken to this issue over a period of years. Can you commit to, or is it in your interest, your belief that you should commit to the ring fencing of some of the revenue there, uh, especially to soften the blow for the, se the sectors which would feel the wrath of that? In other words, you know, the agricultural sector, uh, the haulage industry, uh, the peat excavation sector, and the driver of, an, of the economy that that was in, in, in my region, for example and the jobs that that provided for in times past and is it not fair and appropriate that they should have at their disposal that revenue for uh, innovation enterprise uh, into the future in order to replace those industries, replace those jobs and allow it uh, lead in the, in, in the advancement of alternative forms of energy and provision which can have a manufacturing benefit into the future uh, also. And finally, in relation to board gosh. That sale took place in 2014, and the income to the state is about 950 million. Yet there was a commitment at that time that 500 million euro be made available for an off-balance sheet model to, provision, to provide social housing. That never materialised, and subsequently, I think in Budget 15, it was said that 10 million per annum over 20 years would be provided for pilot projects in relation to social housing. That still left a shortfall of 200. 
you know, I've asked this question previously, but can you tell me where exactly that went based on the commitment that was made way back in 2014 and considering the expectations that are there for us to be in a position to have a meaningful impact on provisions that, that meet the, the, what's set out in our own agreement with yourselves, especially in relation to affordable housing? Okay. So in relation to the different points that you've put to me there, uh, um, uh, your, your first point, Deputy, there about uh, uh, can... Uh, sorry, Deputy, what was your first question again? I have the second one regarding yeah, no first consequences. Question, it, it, the question amounted to have you at this... If you haven't an indication at this stage as to oh, what the revenue. health overrun will be, yeah. but that you did say that the 800 is cushioned by income in relation to excess income on tax and, ex, and excess... Well, underspends. So, what are yeah. those figures? So, thanks, Deputy. Yeah. So, uh, do, do I know what the uh, tax forecast is going to be for uh, uh, the entire year? Uh, I'm a, uh, I will have a good idea as to what that is in uh, uh, at the end of next week, Deputy, because because at that point I will have all of September available to me, and uh, my officials are going to be looking at trends that are underway in the economy and they will give me their informed view regarding what that means for the rest of the year. In relation to the, uh, um, the point that I made that it will have no impact on uh, budget 2019, I think what I said earlier on, and if I didn't I want to re-clarify it, is that I'm working that it will have no impact on budget 2019. Uh, and I have some work left to do in relation to that. Uh, and uh, that will depend on the decision that I make regarding what is the final figure that health will need. And then secondly, as we debated earlier on then, how much of that figure translates into the base for next year. So that is work that is underway at the moment. In relation to your third question, the underspends, sorry, just on yeah, the underspends. Underspends, and coming on to that, yeah, that's number three, I have it here. Um, regarding uh, uh, what it is by government department, uh, I don't have that available to me, but I can get it for you. It is published, Deputy, so I, I will be able to get it for you quickly. If you look at where we are in the fiscal monitor, the fiscal monitor outlines where we are at government department by government department in relation to their profile. So we will be able to give that information to you. What I would say, though, just to deal with one matter up front, is what is different for this year is that the housing department will be spending the full allocation that they have available to them. Um, this is different to where we have been in the past, and I know you've raised it with me, uh, because um, uh, that has not been the case in previous years. In relation to your fourth question there about carbon tax, yes, we would use some of the revenue were such a tax to be uh, increased to try to deal with uh, sectors that would be adversely affected by it. But I think I'd have to make the broad point that we, if such a tax change is made, like most of the revenue will then be used to address issues which colleagues have raised with me here this afternoon, principally in terms of what we would want to do in housing and principally in terms of needs that we would have for health in the future. But yes, I would look to leave aside a portion of that to deal with um, uh, adverse effects that could develop by sector uh, and to see how we could continue, well, accelerate our progress, frankly, in relation to a, uh, a, a, an economy that's less reliant in relation to carbon. In relation to board gosh, I've answered that question for you in the past, but I'm going to have to get that answer again as the committee goes on. I don't know it immediately. And then in relation to one other question that was uh, uh, pending from earlier on, I was asked earlier on by Deputy Doherty, what are the figures that are available for additional housing for 2019 that are already built into the ceilings that we have published? It's 160 million euro on building acquisition and 100 million euro for programmes like LIHAF and retrofitting of homes. Okay, thank you very much. Deputy Joan Burton. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm conscious that we're meeting in the week of the uh, 10th anniversary of the, uh, of the bank guarantee. And um, in that context, um, can you say if uh, your department is either seeking or has sought uh, to uh, recruit uh, consultants with a view to reviewing uh, bankers' pay, 
Um, their current limitation, I think, is around the half a million mark. And um, I understand that there has been, pre the budget, some avid lobbying by bankers to stress their poverty and how they need a pay rise. So I would just like to know, uh, given that <clears throat> the economic uh, figures and the atmosphere at the moment is very similar, I think, to the period 2005 to 2007. In other words, there's been a massive expansion of the economy, um, but there are also really serious problems as well. And I'm, I, I just like to know what is your position as Minister for Finance on bankers' pay? We have, you are correct, we have gone out to tender for a consultant that would give me an assessment of where we are on banking pay and compensation. That report, um, I think, is in the early phases of being done, and I think I'll get that later on this year. Um, banking policy uh, uh, stands as it is, uh, which is consistent with the time when you were in government deputy. Uh, uh, a matter of that, you know, I am increasingly having to deal with is we have so many banks that are now located here in Dublin and in Ireland that because they are not foreign, they are not domestically owned, they are not subject to uh, our banking policy in relation to remuneration. And uh, that is an issue then for banks that the state owns. Um, but as I said a moment ago, uh, there is a review under relation to us. I announced this as part of the decision that I made to vote against remuneration, a resolution on remuneration at the uh, AIB AGM, and I'll be receiving a report on it later on in the year. Um, can I just say, you know, have we learned anything? I mean, I know the L'Oreal principle is because they're worth it, but do you really think that uh, those people in sharp suits are worth half a million a year each. I, 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 I actually, I, I'm actually outraged that the Department of Finance and DPAIR between them would literally turn your backs on any learning we might have had of when the boom got boomier, as it's getting now, notwithstanding really serious infrastructure deficit, uh, whether it's, you know, fixing rural roads that the previous speaker has referenced, or whether it's the really awful housing and health crisis. I mean, people are, at the moment, Minister, stretched to understand why this government can't perform in housing or in health. And, and yet you're telling me you're giving the ear to I mean, what is it that bankers do that merits more than a half a million a year? I can think of lots of people who do valuable work, like really valuable work, but they wouldn't even dream of putting their hands out for half of that figure. Like, have, have, has there been a period of reflection in the Department of Finance and, and DPAIR about learnings from the crash? I, I'm just shocked, and, and to be perfectly honest, I think almost everybody in the country will be shocked as well. It's actually heartbreaking to hear the department uh, saying this. Uh, Deputy, um, I'm implementing the policy that is the same policy as the, when you sat around the cabinet table. When I uh, sat around the cabinet all, table, and, and I insisted. All I am saying, and me, all I am saying I'm Deputy, answering your question, Deputy. Answer, I know, I know, you don't like to be reminded of your time in government. No, I do like uh, to be reminded uh, when I make these kind of points to you. But I've said to you, the policy that I'm implementing uh, at the moment is the policy that stands. Uh, all I have said to you is that we are assessing this, and, and I've explained why, Deputy. Uh, uh, it is uh, a matter of. Uh, uh, great reflection for me regarding why certain salaries exist in different sectors. Banking is a leading example of us. What I have said I am doing is that given how many international banks have now massively increased their presence here in Ireland, and given in particular the growing effect that technology companies are having on uh, wage levels and a competition for talent within that sector. That is having an effect on the ability of banks that we own to re retain staff. 
All I have said is that this is a matter that is worth reviewing. That's all I have said. Uh, and I'm under no illusion that if we were to make any change in this area, of course, there would be considerable and massive public concern in relation to it. But just to make a point there in relation to infrastructural investment, um, I mean, we are increasing investment in infrastructure next year by a quarter, by 25 per cent. It's an additional one and a half billion euro is going into hospitals, schools and housing. And uh, that's happening because it's needed. Uh, and uh, uh, all that is underway. Uh, under a minute, just to let you know. Yeah. I want to ask you, in relation to the proposed uh, possible changes in carbon tax, uh, do you propose to compensate people on social welfare uh, for the impact of increased carbon taxes, which would hit people on social welfare, particularly pensioners, extremely hard? And um, does that mean, in effect, therefore, that we can anticipate that for everybody who receives a weekly social welfare income, uh, you will have a five uh, euro a week increase? Well, I can't see how, if you change carbon taxes, you can do less than that. Well, I know, but, I, but, but look, Thanks, I'm, my, 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 firstly, uh, I've already said that were there to be a change in the carbon tax, there would be effects elsewhere, particularly within our society, that I'm mindful of, that uh, uh, there would be an expectation of a response to. That answer still stands. Um, in relation to changes in general social welfare rates, um, Deputy, as somebody who, 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 who would have been involved in the process yourself, like we have not made decisions in relation to that yet, um, and uh, we have uh, much work to do before we get to that point. Um, you know, I think it's commonly acknowledged, I mean, the Climate Change Advisory Panel, and I know the Labour Party is as aware of the challenge that we have in climate change as much as anybody else. The Climate Change Advisory Panel are strongly recommending a move in carbon taxation. Yeah. And uh, 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 if, you have a, if you believe a carbon tax policy should stay as it is, that's an understandable policy. Um, uh, but as I said, if there were to be any change in it, I know what the effects will be elsewhere, uh, and uh, I know there would be an expectation of me to respond to them, Deputy. Yeah. Thank you very much, Deputy. Uh, I, I just no, have one sorry, brief no, question. No, okay. you can, we will have an opportunity for you to come back in after the other uh, deputies again, so there will be a, an opportunity Fine. to do that. Deputy Hayden. Uh, thanks, Chair, and sorry, Mr. Beginning of the meeting, thank the Minister uh, for his time here. I, I think just mindful of what Deputy Burton said previously to be making comparisons between now and 10 years ago, I think it's fair to acknowledge that our tax base is considerably widened now uh, than, than when the boom was getting boomier and uh, the crash then happened. And I, I think we are in a um, in, in better shape in that regard and acknowledge the work you, Minister, continue to do um, in bringing us towards balanced budgets, growing our economy and reducing our national debt, uh, which is all what we need to do, and the importance of sustaining our recent progress uh, to maintain our careful uh, management of the public finances is a given. Uh, I support a prudent approach, including the establishment of the Rainy Day Fund, um, which I think is all helping in that regard and is real facts, uh, uh, real examples of how we've, we've learned from mistakes in the past. Um, and I also support the increase of spending, well, it's, it's not contradictory, but the increase of spending in terms of uh, our infrastructure overall to increase it by 25%, as you outlined, uh, through Project Ireland 2040. While there may be some risks in, in a small way in terms of overheating of our economy that, that some have referenced in the past, the bigger risk is that we fail to make a catch up on the lost decade that we've had in terms of building schools and hospitals, increasing our hospital capacity and beyond. Um, in terms of climate change, I would just say that uh, you know, in a year when we've had three very substantial uh, weather events, it is really important that this budget um, continues to make strides in terms of us re reducing our overall emissions because um, you know, there can't be any denying of the fact that uh, climate change, and as a member of the Climate Action Committee, which is on at the same time and I'll step back into now, um, you, you know, it, it, is, it is very important that it's a coordinated whole of government approach. Even in, in the first few weeks, we've only had a, a month of our meetings, the Climate Action Committee already, but the one point that has come across from nearly every person who's been in to present to us so far has been no one department can fix this. And it can't be a silo, one minister's responsibility. It needs to be a whole of government approach, and that's no more important than with your department minister. Um, but obviously, it is important that we consider vulnerable groups that are particularly adversely affected by any particular changes, should they happen. So I'm not going to repeat the 
earlier points that were made, I, I had a number of questions that have kind of been touched on already. I am going to take my opportunity to, to raise just one point, though, uh, a point I've raised in the past um, that I think is, is as relevant now as it ever was before, and that is in the area of betting tax. Um, and I don't expect you to comment, Minister, because I know that we're not going to get into the area of speculating, but I will just make the point that while from a high of 20% betting tax in 1984, it was 10% uh, in the 1990s, 5% in 1999, uh, and 2% then in 2002. I never felt there was any justification for the drop-in of the betting tax from 2% to 1% in 2006. I think that was a particular uh, mistake. If you look back at our country uh, and how much betting activity has changed in recent times. In 2001, we took in 69, uh, 68 million euro in betting tax. That was at a time when there was a turnover in activity of about 1 billion euro in the betting industry. That has, that has increased fivefold now. We have over 5 billion, about 5.5 billion of betting activity in this country. And compared to when it was 1 billion, we are taking in less money. Um, and that's not right. I, I don't think it's, uh, it, it's something that should continue. Um, the net income was 52.2 million, 52 million in 2017. Um, and I do think there's a very strong case there, particularly when we consider issues of problem gambling uh, and the challenges that particularly young men um, in, in this country face. Um, the prevalence of uh, betting online now, it's, it's an area where we need to take steps. We did an amazing job uh, by putting in place um, the tax on the remote operators, which many people reckon we wouldn't be able to do. And I know Minister Noonan previously, your predecessor, did say to me, we need to let that system bet in. That is now bringing in, that's a considerable difference. In 2016, we were only taking in 31 million. Uh, that's up to, was up to 50 million in 2016 and 52 million now. So that 20, 21 million extra that's coming in online, that system is bedded in now. But I do feel there is a very strong case there uh, for that increase. And that's just the one point I'm going to make, not to, um, Go and repeat contributions that we made earlier on other areas. Okay, well, look, I'll, I'll be taking that on board, taking that view on board. I mean, it's something that was covered off in the tax strategy group papers as well, uh, Deputy uh, Chairman. And uh, uh, I know that this is a matter that Deputy Hayden and also Minister John Halligan have strong views on, uh, and we'll feed all that in as we make decisions next week. Minister, now, as, a, uh, as agreed in terms of format, just to go back to deputies who have waited who wanted an opportunity to come back, the first person to indicate to me was Deputy O'Brien. Uh, so, again, we just have a, an opportunity for another quick, quickish round of questions, but Deputy O'Brien. Just some brief questions, and um, I don't know if you'll be able to answer them, Minister, because I'm not asking you to give away the budget, but just in relation to the Slante Care Report. Um, you know that the report recommends that for next year, if we were to start implementing it, we would need a, an additional allocation of 396 million. Is it the intention of government to start implementing salon to care? Um, and if so, are we looking at a full allocation, or are we? Will that has that yet to be determined based on your negotiations and your discussions with? the Department of Health in relation to the overrun, is that going to have a bearing on how quickly we can implement salon to care? It's, it's genuinely still to be determined, okay. uh, Deputy. Though what, what I can't do is I can't divorce the costs in relation to salon to care implementation from the costs that I have to meet from funding our health services that are organised now. You know, you, won't, you would not thank me if I was to make a decision that, for example, affected the number of home help hours or the availability of uh, uh, nurses within our hospitals in order to fund a whole package of new measures on the Slauncher Care. And it does fall to myself and the Minister Harris to try and find a balance. But we haven't yet agreed on that and uh, we're uh, hope to be in a position, though, to make progress on it. I think one of the challenges that I face, I'll just make a broad point, is that when you face kind of commission after, you know, various different commissions of various different groups that all make recommendations about their policy area, of course, the trick then and consequence of this then from a national finance point of view is we have to try and pull all that together at the end of the day. And... Uh, you know, Slauncher Care is something that will get more resourcing and will get more support. And everybody in the Iraqis who is involved in drafting Slauncher Care put an awful lot of work into it. But there are also many other competing needs that I have to try and meet. Look at the discussion we've just had on housing. I could probably be in here all afternoon with you about the education sector. 
yeah. and we have to try and knit that together, Deputy. But one thing you said last night that I want to rec recognise is you had the, the, uh, the uh, it made the very fair point back to me when uh, uh, that I don't have a monopoly in solutions either, and you addressed me on it, and you're right about that. Um, but what I have to try and do, though, is find a way in which we can fund progress on all of the different solutions that people want me to do. And uh, that's uh, why the budget is, uh, is demanding. Uh, Minister, you'll appreciate I'm not in this brief very long, so I'm still learning the brief. But in relation to the underspends in departments, you have indicated that the overspend in health will have to be built into the base if it's determined it's a recurring cost. And you're going to try and mitigate some of that through um, increased or over the, the taxes which have exceeded expectations. Uh, and we know that some of them are running uh, above what we had predicted, uh, particularly corporation tax. Um, you also said that we would try and offset or mitigate some of it by the underspends in the department. Uh, and it's just a simple question because I don't know the answer. Uh, in previous years, if there is a consistent underspend in a department, do we identify why that is uh, being underspent? And is it a case that that would ever be deducted from the base the following year then in terms of, or is it always this is what the budget is. If there's an underspend, we don't deduct it from the base the following year. We just start from there and add on our demographics. Well, Deputy, it's a very prescient question, actually, because uh, I can tell you what happens then is when you're in, in, get, engaging with government departments and they have an underspend in a particular year uh, or in part of the year, uh, what normally happens is they assure you that it will all be spent by the end of the year. That's what normally happens. It doesn't and, happen. And, and it doesn't always happen, to put it mildly. And the reasons for it vary government department to government department. My most, the kind of the most frequent issue that, that I've seen happen is uh, when we get uh, into December in relation to capital expenditure. Expenditure in December can sometimes be reliant on where we are in the planning process or procurement process. And particularly in relation to procurement, sometimes things can happen in December that are genuinely outside of the grasp of a government department, but then by that point it shifted into another budgetary year. Um, and, uh, but even if a government department has persistent underspends from a capital point of view, they will always assure me that this year is different and that they will spend it all. Uh, and then why you then get involved in putting so much effort into all of these things is trying to make a judgment call regarding where they'll actually end up at the end of the year. And the final question is just in relation to uh, taxes and the forecasts. And again, I haven't studied this, but I know from studying the health budget, it's quarter four, where we always see a significant um, I suppose because of the recruitment, the pressure is in relation to that. And I was looking at the um, August 2018 figures uh, for excise duty were 249 million under where we were uh, predicted. Are these cyclical as well in terms of quarters, or like would we be confident that? Is there usually a, an increase in quarter four in certain areas in terms of taxes? Um, and the other one is the stamp duty, we're about 70 million under profile. Yep. Are, are we confident, or are they based on you know, different quarters, more profile. profitable yep. than others? Thank you, Deputy. In relation to your first question, I think the key factor in relation to where we've ended up on customs and excise has been the preloading that took place of cigarettes in advance of plain packaging coming out. Uh, and uh, as I look into the remainder of this year, uh, uh, I, I think the, the trend that has now been established across the first three quarters of this year is likely to continue into the final okay. quarter. Um, this is certainly something that I will be mindful of if we're making uh, kind of future decisions in relation to tobacco, uh, uh, that we need to be, you know, consider the degree to which uh, additional increases will yield the kind of yields that they might have got in the past. 
In relation to stamp duty on commercial property, as you will know, Deputy, the first quarter of the year, we did get off to a little bit of a slow start in terms of where we are versus profile, but we were ahead of where we were versus the previous year. That's improved, and as we move into this year, we're still a bit behind. I am still cautiously optimistic that we will deliver at or near our target. Uh, uh, and the reason for that is, is that um, it's an incredibly lumpy tax and we just have to have a small number of big commercial property transactions to take place in the final quarter and it can have a huge effect on where we end up in the year. And given that the magnitude of the move that I made on stamp duty and commercial property, I don't think was expected by all, that might have had an effect on the start of this year. Uh, so uh, I think we're going to do we're going to do okay there. And the final one is v VAT. We're about 80 million behind in relation to. That. And I think on VAT we're going to be fine. My expectation is that we're going to be fine overall. While that is a lot of money uh, for any of us, it's a very small percentage of where we are in the total tax take for VAT. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Count. Thank you, Minister. Yes, still on this health figure because nothing disappoints people more to hear of such a, a large overrun in the Department of Health that they don't see on the ground, especially when they're part of the unfortunate queues in relation to waiting lists, in relation to home help hours and other delivery of services by the HSE. So just the recent history here, if you take last year for example, the then HSE Chief Tony O'Brien, how much did he seek from the Minister to stand still well, in relation to extra funding for this year? Sure. M M Mr O'Brien didn't seek any additional funding off me. I know that. From his line minister. From his line minister. You see, it works the other way around because what happens is the funding is agreed between the Department of Health and the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and then of the funding that is available, the service plan is then worked out. Okay. So um, that, that's, that's the kind of Is it of not widely known that he would have sought from the Department of Health, whom in turn would have sought it from the Department of Public Expenditure, whom in turn may have sought it from uh, current underspends to meet the gap in the region of 800 million? Uh, I, I think it's fair to say uh, that there it's, I mean, it's, it was more than fair to say it's publicly known that Mr O'Brien wrote a letter in relation to this. But with respect, Deputy, when, I'm, when we're doing the budget each year, like we have many, many, many different stakeholders in the budgetary process who make their views known regarding how much additional funding is needed. Uh, and but it only falls to my two departments and then the government to knit it all together. I, 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 I gratefully respect that and, and understand the responsibility you have. It, 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 it comes with the pleasure of office and the it responsibility and the perks and the, all that goes with it. And we're glad to be able to accommodate you in so far as we can. But having said that, there is something emerging over the last number of years that would appear to allow us all to believe it's normal to be overspent in the Department of Health by six or seven hundred million. Well, it's not very normal for the public, unfortunately, because they don't see that on the ground. And if I am doing my job effectively and properly and sincerely, and I want to help and assist those who are most vulnerable, whether it be children or the elderly, and yet there's a huge discrepancy between what the HSE believe would allow them to stand still and what the Department of Health and Public Expenditure uh, believe otherwise. And in the meantime, we're overspent. In the meantime, current expenditure, def uh, you know, current expenditure underruns are funding this, which means you then have to, in the unenviable position, of have to raise revenue sources elsewhere rather than taxation or rather than borrow, which you understand you can't do. And that makes everybody's job more difficult. But it's those who feel that the most are those who are in the queues, are those who can't avail of home help, are those that, you know, when you talk about Alzheimer's disease, uh, dementia, 
you know, the package that's needed there is not excessive, but it's a long way short of 800 billion. Yeah, so no. It's just that frustration we have. And the last thing I want to see, or we would expect, is somehow or other that this becomes the norm and somebody and it's you know and nobody can get a handle on health. You know, as Jonathan said, like I mean you just launch a care programme which is something else that has full support from all parties and none to proceed along that path and you have to do that parallel to this to this problem. No, I, I accept the trust of your argument, and what I am not doing, nor will I present to you, Deputy, uh, a kind of a narrative that looks to normalise this. In fact, last year, if I look at where we ended up in terms of the scale of the supplementary that the department got, in combined with the budget allocation that I made available to them, showed a very significant improvement and change in versus where we had been in the previous year. So we saw a smaller supplementary estimate come in and we had seen a good budget allocation for it as part of budget 2017, I think it was. Uh, and I'm not looking to normalise this. And uh, what I'm, this is why I'm taking care in answering questions that you are putting to me, Deputy. Because once I indicate what that figure is, that's what it becomes. And I am... Um, as I put together Budget 2019, I'm taking a lot of time to focus in on what the ELS figure for the Department of Health is. And the ELS figure is what is the figure that is needed to maintain all the services they have. And uh, I am taking a lot of care in agreeing that figure with the Minister for Health. Okay, look, I, I just hope shortly will come the day that the Department and the HSE and yourselves can come to an agreement that's a lot closer to, 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 to one another than is presently or has been in recent years. Could you just can I say on the National Development Plan next year and the extra one and a half billion, can you make available to the committee the various allocations across the various departments so as that they can begin to decipher when you say more schools and more hospital expenditure will happen next year that we can begin to narrow down exactly where that would be in the coming year? Notwithstanding the expectations that are there beyond that into the 2040 programme, or the effect that may negatise against that in relation to Brexit, for example, we spoke about earlier, where you could be looking at a percentage difference in the output. Yeah, the and, and, y y yes, I will, it's the short answer. But what I said earlier on, uh, just to be very clear in relation to the Brexit effect, is I have a hard exit, or a disorderly exit, is I've got lots of conditions around that. I think later on uh, in the process, as we move into this, it may be appropriate to spell out more what it would be. Uh, 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 but as I said, there are so many unknowns in relation to what a disorderly Brexit would look like. At a minimum, we can expect that the kind of changes that we might have seen happen across a couple of years could move into a single year and even a shorter time period than that. Uh, so the effect of it at a very minimum could be what I referred to earlier on, uh, but I think you know, on budget day and afterwards it, it may be appropriate to uh, outline that more fully. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Burton, as, as promised, just to come back in, we're Thank heading you. into our final few minutes, but we're... Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to raise an issue, Minister, that I've raised with both you and the Taoiseach on quite a number of occasions, and that's the question of the hospice t section 39 organisations. As you know, uh, because of the way hospitals recruit, uh, they uh, recruit on a particular basis, and of course, uh, hospital uh, staffs of various grades have uh, been the beneficiaries of the restoration, uh, you know, which was initiated when I was in government. However, the hospices who recruit exactly the same ho uh, staff and for whom there's a lot of, uh, if you like, back and forward uh, between hospitals and hospices, and it's a really uh, good uh, experience that having that happen, means that from uh, the beginning of January, hospices had to pay the increase without any uh, reimbursement from the government of the cost of the increase. The annual cost of the increase at the moment for the five hospices involved, uh, the hospice in Cork, the hospice in Limerick, St Francis Hospice 
uh, and a number the, hosp the hospice in Donegal and a number of other hospices uh, is uh, 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 1.126 million ongoing. And the retrospective element is uh, estimated at just under a million. Now, your presentation here indicates, I think today, um, that you're approaching the uh, forthcoming budget in the knowledge that actually there are very significant flows of monies into the Exchequer. And while we have a total mess in housing and health, nonetheless, uh, you're going to be able to meet uh, your targets. So what I just want to ask you is, you, you have gone on the record publicly, as has the Taoiseach, as appreciating the really valuable work that hospices do. And I think all of us know that through relatives and you know, personal experiences uh, within our broader families and friends, that dying in a hospice in Ireland with a very serious illness is a very different experience to being in a busy general hospital with just screens around the bed. You've expressed your support and sympathy for the hospices on a number of occasions. In the context of how relatively small the money is in this particular case, I just cannot understand uh, why, you f why you failed to actually act. For one reason alone, I don't think anyone can understand why the Minister for Health, your colleague, is entirely unable to influence the runaway budget in his department. Because usually when somebody is a minister, part of their job is to actually meet the budgetary targets. That's what they commit to try to do. And of course, all ministers have difficulties. But this has been brought to an art form in the Department of Health. And we have a situation where the money is pouring in, but in fact, uh, partly because of demographics and other reasons, uh, the actual deficits are growing. And I don't think you denied that it's possible that the deficit this year could be above 800 million, maybe even reach a billion, and the Taoiseach has indicated the same to me. So why would you single out the hospices for the kind of treatment that you and your Taoiseach have decided? And also, can I just say this to you in practical terms? given my ministerial experience and my own professional experience. The hospices have now developed an in-hospital service with hospice staff to go into busy general hospitals and try and actually help people and the hospital uh, when people are uh, approaching end of life. That service has really been good. They have a service level agreement with the HSE on that. So it's actually saving a HSE, which I don't think is functioning optimally, to put it mildly. And yet, they who took the cuts, they're documented, you've been sent the documentation, they're documented, they cannot get you and your Taoiseach to agree to a restoration process. I, I, in, in the context of a dysfunctional health service, in terms of meeting any of its budgetary targets, I, I, I wish you could just explain it. Well, there are many great things happening in our health service and uh, within the housing market, uh, what I acknowledged earlier on, the great pressure uh, that has been caused uh, by uh, the state of the housing market at the moment in relation to tenants, people are homeless, people who want to buy a home. We are seeing more homes being built. We are seeing more planning permission being granted. Having said that then, to deal with the issue that you have raised, uh, uh, that matter is now back in the Workplace and Relations Commission. Uh, while it is in the WRC, I don't believe it would be appropriate for me to comment on it, because that has now been dealt with again by mediation. In terms of uh, uh, why it is different though, to other parts of the health service, the reason why it's different to other parts of the health service is because the government, uh, 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 the, the individuals who work in Section 39 organisations work for employers who are not the state. 
That's why there's Section 39 organisations. And maybe what I might do, uh, 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 Deputy, is share with you some of the figures that are involved in the implementation of a move uh, for saying that the state would pay all future wage increases across all organisations, what the revenue consequences of that will be. And I, I can tell you they are many, many, many multiples of the million euro that you referred to earlier on. But as I said, the matter is back in the WRC. I uh, appreciate and have had first-hand experiences we all have had of the work they do locally and within constituencies. Uh, and I hope within the WRC the issue can be resolved. So, you, sir, sir, you're, you're, you're going to have one just very quick reply because we sure. we're over sure. our time already in terms of what yeah. we have for this meeting. I think it's actually important. Yeah, I, I'm very sorry. There are people I, I, I'm dying not, in all the sorry, cities. Sorry, and deputy. We can't I'm sort sorry, this. deputy. I'm not disputing the importance yeah. of it. Yeah. I'm just making a comment. You, you've actually had, just for clarification, you've probably had longer than uh, almost all of the deputies in terms of questions yeah. put to the minister. So but, there's no unfairness yeah. in making this point to you. So if you could very briefly. Yes. Um, the WRC process is underway at the moment. The hospices are not part of that because their members, their members, the people they recruit, their staff, are members of unions like nursing bodies and doctors unions and other unions related to health service staff because, as I said, they flow across. That means that at the moment, as I understand it, most recently from um, the lead SIPTU negotiator, a broad framework offer has been put on the table by the government, which I think has been welcomed by the unions, to actually, for the other Section 39 organisations, who uh, are, as, 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 as you've described, to actually be offered restoration with a small back pay offer, I think, going back to last, to, to going back to October, to be paid in January, backdated to October. What I'm asking you, Minister, is can you indicate that you will give a similar arrangement to staff in the hospices, but because they are coming from general hospitals into a hospice, they don't fit into your particular category because they are in general health unions which deal with those issues specifically. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Uh, uh, well, uh, in the appropriate point for me to answer that question will be when the WRC process is concluded, not before it. And the challenge I face, Deputy, is that you have made the fair point that there are organisations who will be um, involved in this process that not, might not be represented directly in the WRC, and I'm sure that's the case. But there are many, many, many other organisations out there that the state uh, pays for, but the individuals who work in these organisations don't work for the state. That if the principle is established that we are going to pay for all future wage increases that happen under future public service wage agreements for every organisation in the state who provides the service on behalf of the state but isn't part of the state, that, that has really big financial consequences. And what I have asked to be done, and I think most of this work has been done already, that I think has infused a bit of dynamism into the process, is I've asked to be informed, you know, organisation by organisation, how do different organisations stand? Because I have evidence available to me that says that some organisations have been able to pay wage increases to their staff to match what has been happening in the next current phase of the PSSA, and at a bare minimum, I need to know what is the financial status of all of the different organisations that are at play here and understand their ability to pay. But the challenge I'm going to face is if this principle is established, the consequences of this will stretch beyond the health sector. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Deputy. And I, 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 I say all of this yeah. with great appreciation for the work that these organisations do. To the bankers, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, thank you, Deputy Minister. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you to you and your officials. Thank you for engagement with all of the deputies here today. It's been a very full engagement. Obviously, we are now just the budget is just upon us. So, not just our thanks for this meeting to you and your officials, but obviously to record it for the engagements we've had in total in the run up uh, to to the budget. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I would thank now you like for your to, time. Thank you. I'd now like to conclude our meeting. Uh, the meeting will now stand adjourned uh, for the day. Thank you, Ed.